My name is Lizzie Angel and I'm a dog behaviour psychologist and I've been helping people with their dog problems for about six years now. And today I'm going to be talking to you about separation distress, which most people kind of know as separation anxiety, which in a sense is true and most dogs when they are away from us will have some level of anxiety and most dogs learn to tolerate that kind of social isolation. It doesn't mean they're particularly happy about it. Anxiety is very mild in comparison with distress behaviours. So separation distress syndrome is usually a collection of behaviours making a dog distressed by being separated from its owner. So when we're looking at problems like this, there are a number of behaviours which can cross over into other aspects of dog behaviour. So, for instance, some separation distress dogs might be very destructive when they're left alone. They might soil the house when they're alone. But it's important to realise that there are other reasons for dogs to do this other than separation. So, the first thing that I want people to do is video the dog while they're not there, because that gives us a much truer picture of what's going on. So is the destructive chewing because the dog is distressed, because of the separation, or is the destructive chewing because the dog is on its own and it becomes an opportunistic behaviour? It's on its own, it's not going to get told off, and let's have fun ripping up a sofa cushion, which is playful destruction, although we wouldn't consider it to be playful because it's destroying our possessions. Separation destruction is much more intense it's a lot more frantic in its nature. You can tell by watching the dog whether it's distressed or whether it's just having a good time basically. And similarly with house soiling, if it's a case of the dog simply hasn't been to the toilet before you've left it and it gets desperate and it needs to go, then it's going to go. With separation related house soiling it's a, a very quick reaction so these kind of behaviours usually happen as soon as the owner has left. Um, the dog has been getting more anxious and more stressed as the owner has been getting ready to leave and then when the owner does leave the dog goes into panic which sends its nervous system into a bit of a um, haywire state and what tends to happen is you will then get the dog maybe weeing or pooing possibly as a result of its nervous system suddenly having that shock. Um, it's like us if we get very nervous you suddenly feel like you want to go to the loo and it's, it's no different for our, for our dog so it's that level of distress that causes that behaviour. Other behaviours included in separation distress syndrome would be excessive attachment, so clingy behaviour from a dog while you're around. Also pre-departure restlessness, so as you're getting ready to leave your dog might be pacing, it might be following you around very quickly, it might be suddenly engaging in frantic bursts of activity and this can all be seen as pre-departure restlessness. Very occasionally a dog will get aggressive as you leave. The distress has moved from the panic of pack drive into the uh, rage of fight drive. So your dog is basically getting very, very agitated. Instead of being in panic and anxiety, it's moving into agitation, and agitation um, can sometimes give rise to aggression. So that can also be included, although it's fairly rare. Other behaviours are excessive vocalisation, so barking, whining and howling, are often very different sounding to the barking that you might get if a lorry goes down the road and the dog barks in response to that. So separation related vocalisations, they're often very very prolonged. They will happen as soon as you leave, they will happen around the front door, your point of exit, and they will often continue for a very long time and sometimes they can become quite rhythmic and turn into compulsive behaviours. So the dog will be receiving some kind of relief through barking or howling and sometimes when it turns compulsive you will get a few barks in succession and then silence and then a few barks and the dog might bark three times quiet, three times quiet, three times quiet and by that point it's turned into a compulsive behaviour which is a reflection of stress. Other behaviours could include, as I've already mentioned, destructive behaviours, 
Um, this can be directed towards furniture. Usually there's a lot of barrier frustration. So the destruction is aimed towards doorways, door frames, windows, curtains, any points of entry and exit. Sometimes you will read in books that the way to deal with separation destruction is to put it in a crate or shut it into a smaller room. But if your dog has barrier frustration, this is actually going to increase the problem because you've presented the dog with another barrier that it now needs to try and get through in order to escape and get to you. So crates and various other barriers like stair gates and doors need to be used very carefully and they can be used but as part of a much much bigger rehabilitation program because what you don't want to do is create more stress for the dog in that situation so barrier frustration is, is quite a big behaviour for a lot of separation distress distressed dogs there are some other behaviours that can be included as well some of the psychogenic behaviours like vomiting um, which is almost like an involuntary response um, and it's, it's psychogenic means that it has a, 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 a psychological origin um, and again it's the, it's the physiological distress of suddenly being separated sends the body into that response. Separation related anorexia so the dog simply just will not eat while it's alone and again you know, we often read that providing an activity toy or food for the dog while it's, while it's alone will help to relieve the separation. But when your dog has separation related anorexia and it won't eat, it's obviously not going to have any effect at all. And, and what people usually find is that the toy is untouched and when they come back into the house, that's when the dog eats. Because obviously at that point, the separation and the dress, distress disappears. Other physiological signs that can be indicative of a dog that is suffering from separation distress are behaviours such as hypersalivation, so when the dog just continues to salivate, panting is another one, whining is another one. Physiological signs which indicate that the dog is under stress. Other behaviours like excessive greetings when you come back in and the dog is so overexcited. Other behaviours like urination when they greet you because the body is just so overstimulated at that point and the dog is so relieved that its isolation is over. And also searching out items of the owner's clothing or belongings. Often they will pull all the clothes out of the laundry basket and maybe drag something to its bed. Um, or lie down in the laundry basket. Um, I've had a few few clients, dogs with separation distress, that that's exactly what they do. They will get into the bathroom and they will lie down in the laundry basket. And this is because it smells like you and your scent is on those clothes. So in that sense, it actually relieves the separation for the dog. The dog does not feel at that point as though it is so alone, even though you're not physically present your presence is with the dog simply by your scent being on the clothes. Dogs who develop separation distress um, are three times more likely to have come from an animal shelter and they are also more likely to have been astray. So it's not really known why this is, um, possibly the sense of abandonment that some dogs might feel through being sheltered or being astray might predispose them in some way. The reason why some dogs develop separation distress and some don't is unclear but there are various causes that could cause separation distress. One reason could be that the dog simply has become sensitised to isolation so it has never actually learnt that being on its own is actually okay. So separation is, is a very traumatic experience for it. With some dogs that develop separation distress, there does seem to be a correlation between dogs who are noise phobic, um, so dogs who are maybe frightened of fireworks or gunshots or, or other outside noises that would normally stimulate the dog while the owner is present and make the dog anxious or nervous. But obviously when the dog is on its own and the owner isn't there, it doesn't have that security of the owner. So the dog is operating in, in flight when it hears the noise and, and defence drive, flight drive is one of the drives that actually influence pack drive. So 
um, the dog bounces between between fear and panic basically so this is how separation distress can arise in a dog that is noise phobic and sometimes dogs who are predisposed to separation distress it goes unnoticed for a very long time and um, because the dog isn't showing any signs of anxiety or distress when it is alone we tend to go along thinking that the dog is fine with being alone where in actual fact for those three or four hours it probably is tolerating being alone and it may also be feeling a mild sense of anxiety, but not enough to actually make it feel the need to try and escape or channel that fear and that panic into um, another activity until it hears a noise and it gets very frightened and then obviously one sparks the other off. And from that point on, um, the dog can appear to have suddenly developed a very large separation problem where in actual fact it's probably been rumbling along for a long time and just has gone unnoticed. If you do think that your dog is suffering from separation distress syndrome or is showing some of the behaviours that could be separation related, it's really important that you do call in a professional to try and help you with this. It's very easy for us to read books and take advice from here and there and try and put them together and sometimes we end up making the problem worse. One of the standard bits of advice that you get is leave the dog with a Kong and put it in a crate but again you can create a much bigger problem by doing this if you haven't first laid a really good foundation in the beginning and, and a good dog professional will be able to help you with this and they will be able to work through the problem with you and support you while you're going through it and that's, that's really important. Mm -hmm.